I'm Rod Clarkin, and today I'm going to be sharing with you a program entitled Glimpses of Africa, Tanzania. This program was taken while I was living in Tanzania from 1975 to 1978. It's a program about the culture, the history, the geography, and the wildlife of Tanzania. Tanzania has been called the Dark Continent. People call it the Dark Continent because they didn't know anything about it. The Europeans initially were in the dark about it, in the same way when we're in a dark room, we don't know what to see, we don't know what is there. The first people to come to Tanzania came on boats. They came on boats like this one here. It's called a dhow. And this dhow was used the trade winds to bring the Arabs to Tanzania and East Africa. They still use these dows today and they travel back and forth. When the first Arabs came, they left the Arabian Peninsula following the trade winds and they established their kingdom on a little island entitled Zanzibar. Zanzibar was very rich in spices and had a very good climate. Sultan there built a kingdom and this is the ruins of one of the palaces there. That island is still very rich but doesn't produce as much as it used to produce at one time. It is largely a communist type of government there. This was the island where many of the slaves and the gold and ivory were brought when the uh, explorers came to exploit much of the wealth of Africa to take to India and Europe. Just across the water, about 40 miles, we come to the capital, Dar es Salaam. People on the coastal areas live in a very simple fashion. They mainly grow rice, they fish, they get food from the uh, trees and such that grow in the area. When the Arabs came over 500 years ago, they discovered people living in very simple dwellings. These dwellings were made mostly of sticks and grass. And they had, of course, a very primitive type of lifestyle. The Arabs brought with them their culture, their religion, which is Islam, and now most of the people who live on, on the coastal regions are Muslims. They also brought their way of life. They brought their language, which was Arabic. And as a result, the, the language of East Africa, Swahili, is largely derived from Arabic. Uh, Swahili word for hello is jambo. And jambo basically is one of the greetings that you can use throughout East Africa. People, though, in the villages and out in the bushland still live in very simple circumstances with no running water, no electricity, and not much change from the last hundred years or so. We're going to go inland a little bit and see how the inner parts of Tanzania look. As we travel inland, we come to more of a savanna type region. Here we find two of the most fascinating and uh, largest trees in the world. These are baobabs. They grow to be over a thousand years old and they grow to get a uh, very huge trunk, sometimes 20 and wider feet in diameter. The Swahili have a story about the baobab and how it used to be so uh, big and proud and old that it used to brag to all the other animals that it was the most important of God's creation. And as a result, God decided to teach it a lesson. And so it uprooted it and stuck it in upside down. And that's why the baobab looks like it does today. The baobab is, uh, also has a very tangy kind of fruit that you can eat and uh, was something that we would enjoy uh, throughout our stay there. As you travel further inland, you come into an area where the uh, peoples have a highland. It's called the Usambara Mountains. Usambara Mountains have 
a lot of coffee and tea. And one of the surprising things is how cold it can be there. Just on the other side of the Usambara Mountains, you come again to another savanna region which has a lot of uh, thorn bushes and shrubs and such. And if you look closely in the background there, you'll see something that's white. When the explorers first came, they didn't know what that was. They couldn't believe that there would be snow on Africa, but that's what they thought. So they went back to Europe and told the scientists there. And the scientists said, no, that's impossible on the equator to have snow. But the explorers, who were mostly missionaries, came and, and climbed to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain in Africa, and discovered that, yes, there was snow there. Mount Kilimanjaro is 19,340 feet tall. It's the tallest mountain, as I said, in Africa. It's a volcanic mountain, and I climbed it twice. Uh, the first time when I was living there with my brother, and the second time in 1979 when I led an expedition back to East Africa to climb the Kilimanjaro and to do research on the Serengeti. My wife and I also lived on the slopes of Kilimanjaro, and we taught school there. Uh, the girls' school was about uh, four to 6,000 feet tall, and it was very cold. The area is very rich. It has volcanic soil, and it has a lot of uh, bananas are grown for the uh, consumption of the local people, and a lot of coffee is grown for export. While we lived there, we lived in this house, which was a very nice house, but it didn't have electricity, and it didn't have running water, which meant we would have to go down to the bottom of the hill where we could get our water and also where the girls from the school would go and wash and bathe. Uh, this is one of the ladies. The uh, different groups of Africa have so many different customs and languages and such that it's hard to characterize them. This is the Chaga tribe and uh, they have become very uh, progressive in many of their ways of farming and uh, government. We also lived right near a village, and that village was uh, where we would go and get our fruits and such, because there was very little to buy in Tanzania, being one of the poorest countries in the world. It was an area where the stores would have maybe four or five items in it, and the uh, transportation was was very primitive. Uh, we would ride this bus that was way there in the background, and uh, that bus would take us to the main town, and sometimes we'd have as many as 30 people on this bus. That's not counting goats and chickens. The area would be traveled through footpaths like this one, and we would have a uh, to go th often through rain because it's a very high area. It gets a tremendous amount of rainfall, which makes it a very rich area. We lived there for a number of months, and then we moved to the foot of this mountain. It is also a volcanic mountain, and you can see the volcanic stones in the foreground there. This is the fifth tallest mountain in Africa, and uh, it's called Mount Meru. I also climbed to the top of this mountain, and it's an, ex an inactive volcano. And you can see in the background how the side of the mountain has been blown away. This area is also very rich in volcanic soil and rainfall and a lovely climate, which creates a, a tremendous area for growing things. They even grow flower seeds, which they export to other countries. The thing that people think about most, I think, when they think of Africa is the wildlife. And I think you can probably guess what that is. No, it's a hippopotamus. And that's how a hippopotamus is most of the time. They stay submerged in the water. That's what you may have thought it was. There are mean creatures, crocodiles. and. Uh, Fortunately, this one was on another side of the fence when I took this picture. 
One of the fascinating and beautiful creatures is the giraffe, the tallest animal in the world. It is an animal that uh, has a skin of about two inches thick, and they're very friendly, even the babies. Some people don't come to Africa to see the animals, they come to see the wild birds because Africa has so many fascinating birds and creatures like that. This is a crown crested crane in the background and we have some uh, flamingos in the foreground. What's this? Why, that's a marabou stork. It's a scavenger and it uh, runs around and picks up the uh, leftovers of other animals. The area has a number of lakes that have been created as a result of the volcano and uh, it has left uh, a beautiful area. In the background, you can't see it, it's Mount Kilimanjaro. It's hidden in the clouds, which it mostly is because it's so high. If you look closely on the edge of those lakes, you might see there's kind of a pinkish tinge. Do you know what that might be? It's thousands of flamingos that are there on an annual migration. Right beside those lakes is a crater, an extinct crater that has become filled in over the centuries, and it has become its own ecosystem in the bottom of that crater. This crater is called Ingerdoto Crater, and you can see the dark green rim around it, and the bottom is like a plain. At the bottom, you'll find all sorts of animals. You have warthogs and baboons and antelope living there. And on the edge, you can find the elephant, the largest land animal in the world. There are also some interesting small animals. Does anyone know what that is? That's called a scarab or a dung beetle. It's a fascinating creature. It has uh, a habit and its custom is to lay its eggs on animal droppings, our dung which gives it its name, rolls that into a ball about the size of a softball or baseball, and then moves that down a path, rolling it, standing on his front legs, pushing it with his hind legs into a hole, buries it, and then the eggs will germinate and hatch. And you have a lot of little baby dung beetles. Another fascinating thing about Africa are its peoples. The peoples are so varied, so diverse, Africa is a continent that is more than three times the size of the United States, has groups that vary in ethnic, racial, linguistic background, so much so that it's very hard to even talk about Africa or even Tanzania. Tanzania alone has over 200 linguistic groups and tribal groups. Africa, we're talking much larger. This group I want to show you is one of the more interesting called the Maasai. They are a group that have, more than other of the tribes, have held on to their old ways. And the Maasai have uh, their own kinds of houses, their own kinds of foods, their own kind of language, and they're different in that they have not so much modernized. Most of the African people are very Western in their dress and in many of their things. The uh, ladies here are creating a roof for their house with grass. Now, here are some younger girls. And uh, can you tell which one is not the Maasai? The Maasai also have a custom of marrying more than one wife if they can afford it. Wealth is measured by the number of cattle. So if you have a lot of cattle, you should have a lot of wives. This particular man that I'm visiting here had about six wives. And his uh, wife, each wife had her own little hut. We had a group picture here before we left. And uh, you can see the man in the center there, besides myself, is uh, wearing a helmet. This was a motorcycle helmet that I used to wear. The boy on the end is wearing a blanket over his shoulder, which is normally what the Maasai men would wear. 
and it has uh, nothing else besides that blanket. So when the wind blows, they get a lot of fresh air. Let's go further inland into Tanzania and see some of the other sites. Here we have the world's second largest extinct volcanic crater. It's called Ngoro Ngoro Crater. It's 10 miles by 12 miles across. And there is a lake at the bottom. You can see the white lake from all the water washing down the chemicals and alkaline material and creating a uh, very uh, sulfury chemical lake. Down at the bottom, you'll find all sorts of wildlife. Here we have the king of the jungle, which is definitely not the most dangerous animal, is the lion. The lion is uh, not as ferocious as most people think, and these are especially not very ferocious as they just finished lunch. This is considered the most dangerous animal in the world. It is the African Cape Buffalo. Of course, this one isn't very dangerous right now, but when it was alive, it was a very uh, aggressive and kind of had a bad temper. The Cape Buffalo, you can see with its horns and its very thick skull, would come charging at you, and there's very little you could do as it comes swinging its head. Of course, have the beautiful zebra and the wildebeest. One day I was driving through here with some researchers and we came across half a million wildebeest. Coax hartebeest. The antelope. And the Thompson's gazelle. Very dainty and beautiful creature. Here are also some dainty but not so much beautiful creatures. These are safari or army ants and one night they visited our home while we were living on the research institute and pretty much took over the place. These are termite hills and uh, it's interesting the different termites build different kinds of hills in different parts of the country. What's that? That's a leopard. Leopard is one of the big game animals. It has a unique ability to carry more than its own weight up the tree. And if you look closely, you'll see it has a, a dead antelope near its tail. And if you can see in the branch below it, it's stained with blood. This picture was taken at dawn, just as the sun came out, and a leopard tends to be a night hunter. There's a cheetah, the fastest land animal in the world. What's this? This is a copy. It's a rock outcropping that you'll find on the Serengeti. It's kind of like a little island on this flat plain. Let's go back and show you how we live so that you won't get the idea that Africa is all wild animals and primitive groups of people. Africa is very developed in many ways and has much of the same features that you'll find throughout the world. While we live there, we live most of the time in this house. It's a house that did have running water, did have electricity. We were surrounded with beautiful trees, flowering bougainvillea, poinsettia. We had many fruit trees, mango, papaya, avocado, lime trees in our yard. It was a very lovely area. Climate was extremely beautiful, and while we were there, we taught at a school, which was just behind our house. Students from the school and from the area have come from many different areas of the world. You have a number of immigrants who have come from India and Asia. You also have a number of groups who have, who have come from different African countries. These are different students and some of the different uh, views that you'll see of Africa. You'll have all sorts of people, all sorts of faces, all sorts of customs and ways of doing things. There's much to learn and to see in Africa, much that we could benefit from in our country. While we were there, we had two children, and we had our children named following the African tradition. We didn't give our children a name at birth. 
we decided to name them nine days after they were born. So we called together all of our friends. We had about 50 people come from different parts of the world and different groups of Africa. And we chose names for our children. And our first, we wanted to choose names that would be, uh, reflect some of the qualities that my wife and I believed in. My wife and I are both Baha'is and we wanted a name that would be spiritually uplifting. And so our first daughter's name is Zia, which means enlightenment of God. And our second daughter's name is Rehema, which means the mercy of God. And so as the sun slowly sets on the Serengeti, we say goodbye to another day in Africa. <laughs>